Hi everybody, uh, so my name is Clive Kenny. I'm a lecturer in the School of Computer Science and Electronic Engineering at Bangor. Uh, what I thought I'd do in this talk is um, look at a few areas that I have particular kind of interest in, so procedural animation and virtual reality. Uh, so these are subjects that I teach, they're subjects that I do research in, I do some work with industry with as well, and that's what we're going to look at in this kind of open day um, demo. Um, there's actually quite a lot of modules that um, are related to what I'm talking about here. So these are the kind of modules that you would do um, in, a, in, a, in a course in computer science or in computer science and game development or maybe creative technologies. Um, at Bangor. So I highly recommend if you are interested in this kind of area to have a look at the courses and the modules within uh, to see what kind of flavour of, of course best suits you. But generally speaking, most of these are accessible from quite a few different courses. So of course, programming is very important. Um, we teach you Java, C, C Sharp, Python. Um, this work that I'm going to show you is mostly with C Sharp, um, just because we're using Unity, which is a, the game engine. Um, computer graphics is very strong in Bangor. Um, my, my background, my PhD is in computer graphics and it's, it's definitely a subject that appears a lot in this talk as well because we're looking at procedural animation and virtual reality. Um, AI and game design is a module that I teach in the second year um, and that's very much also um, a lot of the slides actually from this talk you will see them in AI and game design. Uh, advanced game development um, is a third year optional module. So if you're interested in, in developing games, that might be um, something you'd want to do. Uh, 3D modeling and animation, similarly in the third year, you can go down that route as well um, and learn how to actually use Blender to make 3D models, similar to what you'll see in this talk. Uh, and then finally, as you went to the third year and you've got some experience and you've done quite a lot of these modules, you might want to actually do your final year project, your dissertation in this kind of area. Um, so I, for example, supervise themes like virtual reality and AI and game development. And there'll be themes for pretty much any, any, um, any spe kind of special subject you can think of. Uh, but if you are interested in this kind of theme, then certainly you'd be probably um, supervised by someone like me for your dissertation. So I'm going to start with a video of some work I did quite early on um, in my career. We're talking about 10 years ago for this. And this is a virtual creature, a virtual spider. Uh, the idea here is this creature is animating using algorithms, is using very basic artificial intelligence to move around. Uh, and this kind of technique is known as procedural animation. It's where we use numbers, we use algorithms to drive the motion of the virtual creature. So this spider isn't the most intelligent, dexterous you know, creature, at least compared to the real world equivalent, but it's slowly getting better. So as this video goes on, you would see that the, you know, the, the spider starts to behave in more spider-like ways, is able to climb up surfaces, climb around things. The advantage here, of course, is once you've got this system working and stable, you can pretty much apply it to any context. So you can make something walk, as in this example, on the surface of a sphere, or you could drop it inside a box and make it walk around the box. Or obviously, you could drop it into a video game and have it you know, interact with the, the scene, with the virtual environment in a realistic way. One of the advantages also of procedural animation is the way the animation is all always situated. We call it embodiments, the idea that because the character is actually physically in the environment, all of the animation is, is inherently quite realistic, hopefully, because it's actually there. It's actually tapping on the surface as it's moving from one surface to another. It's trying to balance itself. So you get this kind of very subtle, organic animation that perhaps you wouldn't get unless you had a very talented animator. And even then, that would probably just be for a few scenes rather than for every scene, as is the case here. So... We've also got virtual reality. Now, VR, of course, has come a long way in the last five years. The idea is, obviously, you put on a VR headset and you're in a virtual world and you can interact with dinosaurs or with history or be in outer space or whatever it is. Um, and this is a very powerful, visceral technology and it's only getting more realistic as time goes on, only getting more immersive. Um, you can now buy pretty much for like a few hundred pounds um, very high quality VR devices. I've had the, um, I've had the luck and, and the kind of privilege to work on, on software for all of these pre-release. So before they are available, you'll see an example of the software in a second. Um, but this has come so long, you know, in, in such a short space of time. 
Um, we started out being able to use mobile phones. We'd click the mobile phone into a plastic shell and wear that. And that provided a pretty cool experience and obviously got VR into the hands of millions of people. Uh, PC and console VR has pushed the boundaries in terms of how realistic the graphics can be and how, you know, how immersive the, the graphics can be. Uh, standalone VR came next, and that's all about kind of um, having no wires, basically having the computer and the screen and everything just built into the device. Even the sound just comes out of the strap uh, in the case of the Oculus Go here. Um, and last, a couple of years ago, we had the Oculus Quest, and now just recently we've got the Oculus Quest 2. And this is another example of a standalone VR device. No cables, no wires. It's a mobile device. There's basically an Android um, chipset in here, very similar to you'd, what you'd find in a, in a, a you know, a current generation smartphone. It's got four cameras, so it can detect exactly where you are in 3D space with very high accuracy. It comes with controllers that can track at sub millimeter accuracy where you're where you're moving. Um, you, you can even track individual finger joints, um, so you can do hand tracking. So very powerful technology, and this is opening up so many possibilities in terms of design as well. Um, now, the market itself is growing quite rapidly. Um, VR is, is still in the lead in terms of the amount of billions being generated every year. That's only going to continue. Augmented reality, we will see catch up quite quickly. At the moment, augmented reality on a mobile phone is stuff like Snapchat filters and things like that. Um, but as time goes on, you know, it'll become more things you can wear, things you can put in your ears, and it will become a mixture of kind of the real world and the, and the virtual world. Obviously in VR, everything's replaced. We're replacing what you see completely. Now, if you break down the virtual reality headset and look at all the different bits, um, basically it's the mobile phone industry that's been driving this. So mobile phones obviously have become every year that there's a new innovation they just become smaller and lighter or more high resolution more battery life uh, more power of course similarly graphics have become increasingly realistic we can draw things in vr now we couldn't even dream of drawing five years ago let alone 10 years ago and obviously that continues to allow us to make more realistic more immersive environments as you'll see in a second we definitely take advantage of that in vr uh, when we're developing software as well um, in the mid, in the in the kind of you know behind this plastic shell, there is essentially a mobile phone screen. They're a little bit more customized these days. They're actually you know built to be VR devices, but generally they started out as mobile phone screens, and that's where the tech started, in terms of you know where the actual research and development went in. We then put two lenses in front of that screen, and we obviously blow up the image. So when you wear this device. You get a field of view that's about 110, 120 degrees. It's nowhere near the 170 that we have, but ho hopefully over time it will grow and appear more realistic in terms of a field of view. Um, it's then basically up to us as computer scientists, as game developers, as, as creative people to make a virtual environment and figure out the rules of VR. What can you do in VR? What can't you do? How do you best interact with VR? How do virtual creatures best interact with you? Which is pretty much what I'm going to be doing in this talk. So we can track where somebody's looking in VR, of course. We can track where they are in 3D space. As I showed you, there's cameras now on the headset, so you don't even need to set up external cameras. Um, it's all basically um, self-contained. We can track someone's hands at sub-millimeter accuracy. As I said, this opens up a lot of possibilities in terms of interaction with virtual worlds. If you're good at ping pong in the real world, you'll be good in real life and vice versa. So you can use it for training. With hand interaction, so with hand tracking, finger tracking, we can dream up new interfaces. We can do, you know, from a university's perspective, we can do research projects into what are the best ways of laying this information out, the best way to visualize vast amounts of data, for example, how to kind of move through that data and explore it. Um, and that's all, you know, that could be something you would do for your dissertation project, for example. It's certainly something you would come across in modules like AI and game design or human computer interactions so or modules like that. Now, physics obviously is, is, is also something we can simulate very well in VR now, um, even on a smartphone. This opens up again a lot of possibilities in terms of what we can do in VR and how we, how we design application changes. If the player can do things like this, what does it mean for a virtual character standing in the way? We need to actually detect these things 
or we need to make characters behave realistically to the situation they're in, which is something that we might not have had to worry about as much in a, on a flat screen um, compared to when we're actually immersed in the environment. Uh, so the main application that I've been working on the past few years is called Ocean Rift. Uh, and this has been a collaboration with pretty much all the major players in VR, so Oculus, Facebook, Valve, Samsung, Google. And Ocean Rift is, is basically an underwater safari pack. And the idea is you wear a headset like this and you're underwater. You, sound, you feel like you're underwater, it sounds like you're underwater uh, in essentially a human-sized aquarium. Um, and this app has been very successful. As I said, it launched alongside pretty much every major headset. It's on the, it was on the box of the Oculus Go, for example. Um, it's been available on, on even on the latest device. Uh, it's available in like seven languages now. Um, but the key idea basically is that you are underwater and there's lots of animals that obviously people want to experience when they're swimming in, in a VR simulation like this. Obviously dolphins, great white sharks, sea lions, pre even prehistoric creatures. We want to be able to bring them to life in VR. So how do, how do we do this? How do we kind of, um, you know, make it so that one person like me can make an entire ocean's worth of animals? Well, basically we use computer science techniques. We use programming, AI, algorithms, and some, hopefully some clever design to make, to make everything kind of fit together. Um, so obviously in VR, as I said, it's a human-sized aquarium. Small creatures like these little tropical fish, we can use schooling, kind of crowd simulation algorithms. There's actually an assignment in the second year where you can do this, where you can, I'll ask you to develop a crowd simulation of some creatures. Um, but for the bigger animals, so anything bigger than like a turtle, I guess, you know, some, the dolphins and the whales, um, we need a more complex system. Um, and that's where we kind of have to think about what, if we, if we look at all these animals, what do they have in common? Is there some kind of basic animation system that we can kind of build upon? Now, if you remember back to the spiders, what I had there was a procedural animation system that basically animated spiders for me. And that's essentially what we're going to do here with these virtual creatures. We're going to make a system that can basically, we can build on top of in order to make a, a virtual creature simulator. So I started with a, a backbone, basically a sea snake. Um, and I'm pulsing a signal through the backbone. This is basically a sine wave that's been sent through. Obviously for a sea snake, it's largely going to be side to side, but it could also be up and down. I could also do rotations on the, uh, the roll axis to make it roll around. Think of a dolphin, for example, doing barrel rolls and things like that. So there's ways of manipulating this backbone to make something swim in any way, you know, in any, any form of swimming that something can do underwater. Uh, so this is, again, a similar uh, system applied to a great white shark. Again, it's a sinusoidal sine wave being sent through the backbone. There's a few extra animation details, like the fins, the gills, and the, um, the mouth is moving and stuff like that. But generally, you know, we, we build these things up out of algorithms and out of components. Here's the same shark, but actually in, in the virtual environment, in the uh, shark kind of cage habitat of the application. Now, obviously, you know, we need to figure out what is the best way of getting a shark to swim near the player? How often should they swim near the player? How often they should swim away? We don't want them to swim away for like 10 minutes. We want, but you know, on the other, other side of things, we don't want this, this, the shark to be constantly kind of just nibbling at the cage. You want to find that balance between kind of horror, I guess, or, or you know, at least a mis mystery and, and being kind of um, accessible to people. Now, obviously, in VR, you can leave the cage. If there's a subset of people that want to leave the cage. Um, uh, obviously, you get eaten if you do. On the other end of the spectrum, we have like uh, manatees. So these are obviously much more cuddly, friendly things. Same animation system, though. It's the same system running all of this. Uh, orcas. Um, so I, you can actually feed the orcas in an ocean rift. And you can you know, put fish out in front of them and they will, they will eat them. Again, this is only possible really because we have this flexible animation system running behind. Uh, dolphins, so the dolphins in Ocean Rift are much more friendly, I guess, than a real life dolphin would be. It's very much like a, a, um, a Disney version of a dolphin. Uh, but there's a lot of algorithms, a lot of research. Uh, there's even some PhD, PhD research that's gone into how actually is best, how best to animate a dolphin in a, a virtual environment like this. Uh, we can make sea lions swim through hoops. So this took a while to get working, but you know it's worth it in the end because you can now, in virtual reality, play with these creatures, make them swim through hoops. 
It's VR, of course, so we can set off a firework at the end. Uh, we can bring animals back from extinction and literally swim with them, which is just an amazing thing to do. So this is a um, the Loch Ness Monster, basically, the Plesiosaurus, a baby Plesiosaurus, um, about the length of a car. Um, but this is, yeah, again, the same animation system as we've seen all the way through being applied in, in different contexts. And obviously, you know, we need the big animals in there as well. This is the Pleosaurus or the Pliosaurus, uh, which is... You, you don't want to stay too long in its in its kind of area, otherwise you'll be lunch. Now, as I said, there's lots of opportunities for research here, especially as you get into dissertation, um, beyond into industry and research work and, you know, like um, PhD um, level research or, or beyond. Um, so, for example, here we've got a uh, swimming up to a creature to grab it. Um, being able to interact with it. So again, that's something that was developed for Ocean Rift. It allows us basically to learn about the animals because we can swim up to them and examine them up close. Um, interacting with creatures, this is in its infancy, but being able to just just be able to kind of, you know, do commands and things, that's so, something I'm currently looking at in VR and how we could do that. Uh, when you've got such a pliable animation system, it allows you to do things like this. Another thing that I've done recently is an education mode. And this is basically where you can learn about all these animals. You can swim alongside them, learn about them. So you'll see at the start here that I'll swim up to this glowing kind of orb in the water and I'll touch it and it will start telling me about the green sea turtles. And I think there's about 60 of these in the app at the moment. That It's just a much, it's a really cool way I think of learning um, compared to documentaries or reading a book or something. It's just a really nice way you know, to be able to learn about these creatures in their actual environment. Okay, so that's that's the end of my talk. I hope you found that interesting. Um, as I said, if you, if you are interested in, in this as an area, it's so VR, animation, game development, please have a look at all the courses we have available. Have a look at the modules within to see, you know, which options are available. You'll find there's actually quite a lot of different routes you can take through the courses. Any questions, please let us know. Just send us an email, more than happy to answer. Uh, for the time being, um, I'll see you soon. Cheers.